In this video, we are going to be talking about the Nikon Z6. This is the second of two mirrorless cameras that Nikon has released this year. These are their first full-frame mirrorless cameras. There are two cameras and three lenses. There's the Z7, which is a higher megapixel count. It's a 45 megapixel camera. And then there's this, the Z6, which is a 24 megapixel camera and has some advantages over the Z7 in terms of low light performance video capabilities. We're gonna get into all those in this video. And I wanna give us thanks to Nikon who not only loaned me this camera for review, but they were gracious enough to invite me down to Florida last week, and I spent four days down there shooting with their crew and three of their ambassadors who helped organize some various photo shoots according to their area of expertise. We put this through the paces with still photography and video. I did a lot of shooting on this in a variety of situations. I found the image quality to be absolutely outstanding, as is the video, and there's a lot of benefits that you get with this mirrorless system. There are some downsides too, and I want to talk about them both in this video, but first I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor today who are the awesome folks over at squarespace.com you guys need websites you need them to look good and squarespace have you covered they are an all-in-one solution for building beautiful websites portfolios or even an online store if you head over to squarespace.com you can set up a free trial and if you want to subscribe to squarespace i can save you a little bit of money by using offer code aop on checkout once again that offer code is aop and we give a special shout out and thanks to squarespace for sponsoring another episode of the art of photography so so about two months ago when Nikon was getting ready to announce the Z6 and Z7 and they did a couple little teaser videos, I did a video and I talked about Nikon and mirrorless in that video. And I think it's really interesting because Nikon have experimented with a mirrorless camera before with their APS-C camera, it didn't really go anywhere. And it seems to me that going into full frame was really important for Nikon to get this camera right. And this is a whole brand new system and there's a lot that goes into it. And I also said that I really want Nikon to succeed. I think there's a lot that they bring to the table. And when you start looking at these cameras, they're basically, I think, two different viewpoints that you can look at them. And one is very fair and the other is not so fair, but it is the elephant in the room and that is to compare them with Sony. Sony have been doing the full frame mirrorless thing for several years now. They've really been the only one doing full frame cameras. The bigger your sensor is, the more complex everything gets and the more difficult things get. And while they have a system that's matured, they're on the third version of the A7, for instance. They've got the A9 now, which is a stack CMOS sensor, it's the elephant in the room. And that's one way you can look at this is you can compare it to the Sony's. I think another way to look at this, and I'm going to take this review from two sides, is to consider where Nikon have come from and the usability that they bring to the table. Nikon have a long history of developing really nice cameras and lenses too for that matter. And they have done a really wonderful job at that. This is their first mirrorless system. Unlike Sony being on version three, this is version one. Having said that, we're gonna dig down and look and see what works and see what needs improvement improvement, but there's first one thing I have to get out of the way before we can continue any further. This is a single card slot. Only one card goes in there, and it is what it is. I know it's a strange decision on Nikon's part, but the reason I'm drawing attention to this is because if I don't, I'm going to get a hundred comments of people pointing out the obvious fact that there is no dual card slot design on here. It only takes one card. Unfortunately, no amount of complaining about this now is going to magically make another card slot appear in this camera. It is what it is. However, there is an entire other camera that's built around that one card slot, and that's really what I want to get to today. Let's say this right off the bat that there are a lot of people out there and rightfully so do not feel comfortable Especially doing professional work without some kind of backup in the camera and doing one card slot only is not a comforting thing for them And if that is you this camera probably is not going to be for you because it only has one and no matter how we look at it and how we tear it apart and how much we argue about this, it will only still be one. So now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about the rest of the camera. So let's begin with the physical design. And this is something that I think Nikon absolutely hit a home run with. This is gorgeous. And I would have expected nothing less from Nikon. It's really well done. And one of the things that I always loved about Nikon is they have a wonderful sense of ergonomics and they've extended that over to the Z6 and Z7 as well. It's got a very comfortable grip. There is a raised area for your thumb to rest on the back. And one of the things that I've always loved that Nikon did with their DSLRs is the way the buttons lay out is everything is kind of right under your fingertips and a lot of things are combinations of you pressing a button and then moving a dial and everything is very easy to get to and that certainly extended over to the Z6 and the Z7 as well. At the heart of all the control layouts here is this switch right around the display button and this selects between video and still modes and what I really love is the approach that Nikon have taken with this camera. It's really designed for people who want to move 
move back and forth between those two modes. And I am one of those people and it's really comfortable to use. What I love about it is that whatever mode that you're in, you're going to have your settings set a certain way. And then you may, let's say you're shooting stills and you have things set up a certain way that you want. And then you're going to move over and shoot video. And you change those settings up somewhat for video. When I switch back to stills, it remembered the old settings. This is something that Panasonic does really well in the GH5. It's something that Sony does not do very well because when you move back and forth between modes, whatever your control configuration is, is always still set up. And my workaround for that is using the custom storage settings on the command dial. And speaking of the Z6 and Z7 have three of these, and actually it's six, because remember I mentioned that you use the switch to go back and forth between stills and video modes, and it remembers the settings from the previous one. Well, actually you get three user settings for still modes and three user settings for video modes. So you have quite a bit of flexibility in the way that you set this camera up. So on the top of the camera, moving left to right you have your mode selection dial and on the right side of the camera we have a top level display as well as an on and off switch the shutter release a video record button an ISO function button and an exposure compensation button on the top right we have the main command dial and on the front of the camera right under your index finger you have the sub command dial and if you're a Nikon shooter, you're going to find the dial placement on the back of the camera quite familiar as well. On the left-hand side, we have the playback and delete buttons. On the right-hand side, we have that switch that gets us between video and still modes. And in the middle is the display button. So if I start pressing this, it's going to round robin through all the various display modes that I can use. I have back button autofocus. Underneath that, there's a joystick followed by the info button. We have a command dial. And then you have your zoom functions, your menu button, and also your drive mode. And on the front of the camera we have two custom function buttons which you can map to various things according to taste but by default the top one is set for white balance you're going to hold this in and then move the main command dial to adjust your white balance and the bottom one allows you to scroll through all of your autofocus settings so if you hold that in the main command dial or the back dial is going to go through the various autofocus modes and the front dial or the sub command dial is going to scroll through all of your autofocus area types which we're going to dig into in a second when I get into autofocus. Another aspect of the design that I think Nikon has done very well is the touch capabilities of the rear LCD screen. So not only can you touch to focus, but also they've added gestures as well. So if for instance, I go into my menus, I can simply swipe up to change my page and tap to select. And this is something that I don't think you've seen a lot of up until 2018. And one of the gripes that I have about menu systems really in any camera, some are more confusing than others, but the vast majority of them are list based. And when you're scrolling through list, it makes things harder to find or remember where they are. And I think adding gestures to this is definitely a step in the right direction. Another really cool feature is the joystick in addition to the command dial. Now there is the first bug that I want to point out to you guys. And this is something that is not a huge deal because I think it's something that Nikon can probably fix in a firmware update. But for instance, if I'm on my GH5 or even my Sony stuff, one thing that I do a lot with the joystick is when I'm scrolling through menus is I just use it because it's very comfortable. And you can certainly talk toggle through the menu options with the joystick and I can even go left and right with this for various functions. As soon as I press to select something, it goes back to live view and I went in there and you can actually customize what pressing the joystick in will do, but the only options you have are live view options. You don't have any menu related options. And so that's little one little thing I would like to see Nikon clean up. The other thing is some of the sub menus in here is a little strange. So for instance, one of them deals with ISO selection. So for instance, if I just simply touch on the screen on the ISO, it brings up a little menu and I can change the ISO, but it's a different menu than when I'm trying to toggle on the auto ISO sensitivity. To get to that, you're actually going to have to first go into the info button, then tap on the ISO settings, and then you're going to go down and select your ISO again, and you're going to need to go down on the command dial, and oh, there it is. So I think that could probably be simplified and also consistent. That's not necessarily a negative thing. And one thing I really like that Nikon addresses are there are multiple ways that you can get to functionalities. And this is one of them. It just needs some little cleanup on the edges. But other than that, it's pretty cool. So let's talk about autofocus. This is something that has been somewhat controversial with people who have reviewed this camera. I've been using the Z6 for about a week now, and I put it through a wide variety of situations. And I found that it's actually pretty decent, but I will say it is definitely not really as mature 
matured as a system like what you're going to get from Sony. Sony are at a much different place in their technological growth and it is matured to a point where they have things like IAF. And also remember, and I've said this over and over again, developing a mirrorless camera is a lot more than just taking the mirror out of a DSLR and having a smaller camera. There's a lot that goes into it and it's how the system works together as a whole. And when you consider you getting a live data feed readout from the sensor and what you're able to do with that, you need to be able to keep up with that in terms of not only speed, but also in terms of the physical layout of things like how the lens is designed and is it going to be able to autofocus with enough speed to keep up with what the camera's doing, so on and so forth. And so I, it's not really fair to compare it to Sony because this is version one and Sony are way beyond that. Having said that though, I think whether or not this is a system that is going to work out for you or not is largely going to depend on what type of photographer you are and what kinds of things that you shoot, how fast you need it to be responding. And so for instance, I'll give you a couple scenarios. With IAF, you don't have it on this camera. It does have face detection though, and it does pretty well. If I am in my wide autofocus area of selection in autofocus continuous or even single, it will recognize faces as they come onto the monitor and it will focus in on those. Now, where you're gonna run into trouble is if you were using a razor thin depth of field, and a lot of this is going to depend on your proximity to how far you are from your subject and what lens you're using, so on and so forth. Generally speaking though, with face detection, if you have a really thin depth of field, it's not going to detect the eye. So a lot of times you'll get things like an eyelash in focus or a cheekbone or a nose and it's not totally there. A workaround for this is to stop the lens down, obviously. And I found even when I adapted the 105 millimeter f1.4, which is one of my favorite lenses ever, it is not a native system lens and we don't have IAF. And so for instance, if I shoot that wide open, I'm going to have problems. But if I stop that down to 2.8 even, or I like to go about f4, I have a wider depth of field and for me it really didn't risk being a problem but if you like to do portraits that have that razor thin depth of field manual focus is probably going to be a better option so moving subjects candids it's just going to be more difficult when you're trying to focus in low light it's going to hunt and seek a little bit as well and again that's just going to be a maturing of the system so for instance if you shoot in low light and you rely on autofocus this could probably be a little bit frustrating of an experience tracking works really well it is not perfect but for instance if I am tracking a subject that is in the foreground and it's moving, you're going to see that the track selection is going to track that fairly well. Now where I run into problems is if I'm focused on something in the background and I have something that comes in the foreground in front of it, it tends to push it out of the way and then it doesn't remember where it was. So there probably needs to be a little bit of improvement with this algorithm as well. These are very specific types of scenarios, but they do impact certain types of photography. So if you find yourself shooting a lot in those situations, this might not be the camera for you yet. I have no doubt that Nikon are going to work to improve on this, but this is version one as I keep stressing. Having said that, it's not all that bad. I shot for an entire week last week in a number of situations, and as long as you're dealing with normal situations with pretty decent lighting and there's not a lot of distraction of things running back and forth, for instance, we didn't shoot a lot of sports, it works just fine. And another thing that I want to add to this is that the face recognition when you're using video is very tight, it locks on, and it does an incredible job. Do I feel comfortable using this like I would a Sony as an unmanned camera? I actually think I would. The face recognition is that good. Again, don't use a super shallow depth of field on that because you're apt to have eyes out of focus or something. But if you're using f2.8, f4, depending on how far away you are from your subject, it performs very beautifully. We're gonna move over to Lightroom for a second because I wanna show you the image quality you get with the raw files and what kind of dynamic range we're dealing with because it's actually quite impressive. So this first image you can see is clearly exposed for the sky. This is one that we shot on the airstrip in Florida and unfortunately our poor model is completely dark. We did use a reflector so you can sort of see the side of her face but basically the result is, is we're dealing with too wide a dynamic range of light. Not all of it will display on the screen. Now I'm dealing with a raw file and obviously JPEG, you're not going to have the same results with, but if I turn up the exposure in Lightroom, and I'm just going to gradually bring this up, we're going to blow out the sky obviously, but you can see that we have a lot of detail in our model, and when I zoom in, you're going to notice that we don't have much in the way of noise, so the files do look really good with this camera. These are 14-bit RAW files, but uh, let's zoom back out here. Um, so basically what we're dealing with, let's reset exposure, is we've got the information there, it's just a wider dynamic range than what we're able to display on screen, so I can 
fix this pretty easily if I just start bringing my shadows up. Now you have to be careful with this because a lot of times you're gonna get that HDR look, but I can bring it up so it is recoverable and we can indeed see the model. Might add a little bit of contrast in there and we've got a pretty good looking image with very little effort. It's really impressive what dynamic range you're able to get off of this camera. Also impressive on the Z6 is the video capabilities. In fact, this is the area that I am the most impressed with. I think they have really done an amazing job and it's really awesome to see Nikon step up in that department. Historically, they've kind of lagged a little behind Canon and Sony and some of the others. And I think that they are delivering results that are really quite impressive. And so I'm gonna show you some footage here and what you're looking at. We had a culinary demonstration that was set up and we were testing the video capabilities of this camera. Now, one thing you need to understand is there's a big difference between the Z7 and the Z6. The Z7 is a higher megapixel camera. You've got 45 megapixels. Now, when you are shooting 4K video, it is actually downsampling from 45 megapixels. And so there's some pixel bending that's going on and you just don't get quite as clean an image in the end. Now with the Z6, there is no pixel bending and it is a direct representation of what you're getting on the sensor. There's no cropping involved and the video looks absolutely beautiful. And so a couple of things that I wanna point out on here, when you're recording internally on the camera, you're getting an 8-bit file and it looks pretty good. But if you hook up an external recorder via HDMI, and the one we were using is the Atomos Ninja 5, and you're able to get 10-bit recording, and you can also use N-Log, which is Nikon's log profile. And I found N-Log to be pretty good. Um, I really wasn't familiar with it because I hadn't hooked up an external recorder before the trip, so figuring out how to expose for this, but it was really forgiving. There's really no noise. The base ISO is 800 with N-Log. So if you're shooting outside, you are going to need to use neutral density filters or something to cut the light back if you want, especially if you want to have a shallow depth of field. But the results are amazing, and it was super easy to grade. A lot of times I was shooting on this, and I was shooting just with the built-in profile, and I would recommend you go in and actually customize that because it's going to add a lot of sharpening and a lot of contrast. And one of the cool things is when you're shooting in 10-bit to an external recorder is you can actually bring back a lot of that shadow detail. It's not lost because you have enough information in the file. So much like the raw images, we're able to do some recovery with video as well. It's less forgiving with highlights, but shadow detail is certainly there. And I was really impressed with this. Another thing that I did not expect to see on this camera that I really liked is when you're shooting in 1080. Not everybody wants to shoot in 4K. Not every situation is going to call for 4K video. I have to say the Z6 is some of the cleanest looking 1080p video I have ever shot. And I did some slow-mo stuff because the top speed when you're shooting in 4K is 30 frames a second. And if you want 60, you've got to go down to 1080p. You can do 120 frames a second 1080p as well, but that is only at 8-bit. And so that would be internal recording and we were dealing with the external recorder. But all this footage is simply conformed frame rate. It was shot at 60p and I've conformed it down to 24 for this video. And it looks outstanding. And by the way, this is 1080p video and it's been upscaled in Final Cut Pro and it looks outstanding. I Really, I don't see much of a difference between this and native 4K video. It really is impressive. My experience so far having shot on the Z6 for a week now has been largely positive. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the ergonomics. It's a very comfortable camera to use. It's a very inspiring camera to want to use. But more importantly is that Nikon got the image quality right and the files that I'm getting off this camera are absolutely gorgeous I'm not doing a lot of heavy editing and what you're seeing today they they tend to pop right off the camera and by the way I am getting raw files on this and Adobe actually hooked me up and I have a beta release that allows me to read the raw files from this camera because it's really difficult to judge the camera by a JPEG in the end you need to really see the raw file but you get 14-bit raw files which are absolutely gorgeous and then the 10-bit video gives you a lot of latitude when you need to do some editing or corrections or if you want to shoot log. And I think Nikon got that right. And I'm really excited to see that. And as I mentioned in that video that I did two months ago, I really wanted Nikon to succeed with this because I think mirrorless is important. I think mirrorless is really going to be the future of where we're going with cameras. And I think that for a first offering, they have done an outstanding job with this. I think that this camera makes a lot of sense is that if you are a Nikon user, you own a lot of Nikon lenses and you want to go into a mirrorless system because the adapter works really well and mostly the lenses that I've used with a few exceptions have worked really smooth with this camera. And the ones that haven't, it's because they have sonic wave motors or they're just a little bit older technology and they're not designed for fluid motion for autofocusing for video, for instance. But a lot of lenses work great. And one of my favorites is the 105 millimeter F1.4 and I used it a lot when we were in Florida. It's outstanding and it worked flawlessly on here. I mean, that's a massive lens anyway. So putting another inch on it with an adapter, 
I expected that to be a bigger issue because I've adapted lenses with Sony in the early days when I was shooting that. And this was really smooth and it flowed really easily and everything just seemed to work. So I think it's really important that Nikon did a good job with this system, but I think that's who it's for, is I think it's for Nikon shooters who want to get into that ecosystem. Or if you are interested in Nikon lenses, it opens up a wide variety. I mean, we only have three native lenses for this system right now, but I think Nikon are thinking in that direction. It's gonna be really interesting to see what happens over the next couple of years. Would love to know what you guys think as well. I'm gonna be doing some more videos with the Z Six. I think the video capabilities I'm really impressed with, and so I want to do a dedicated video for that. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun to use. If you guys have any questions, I've got this for a while longer, so I'm happy to answer them and uh, take you through anything you guys want to know about. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then, later. Later.